Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're glad you're here, and uh, we're looking forward to a wonderful time of worship together. Um, I'm glad that we've gotten to this point in this week. I told a couple people this week, uh, this past week, I had to tackle one of my least favorite jobs, and that's sump pump problems. <laughs> Which, you know, it's, it's a pit, and, you know, by the time I figured out what it's done, it ended, it ended up needing a new sump pump. We finally put it in there, and boy, I, f I could sleep easy again, <laughs> especially with the rainstorms we had. And, uh, but it's, it's a pit, and you have to get down in there, and this old back, I'm just like, <laughs> I said to, to my wife, Cindy, I'm not sure this is worth it anymore. <laughs> Whatever I save by doing this myself. But it got fixed, so um, we all have challenges, right? Every week and every, uh, we all face different kinds of challenges, and we can encourage one another in Christ, and I hope that you are encouraged uh, today. Um, we have... A, a birthday today. I think this is Myrna Fowley's birthday today, and she's shaking her head saying that she was hoping uh, no one would notice. Uh, <laughs> but um, why don't we sing happy birthday? Well, I hope that you have a wonderful day uh, and in, enjoy your birthday, Myrna. Uh, for me, I, you know, it's interesting as I've gotten older, birthdays, they're sort of bittersweet, right? <laughs> it's like, oh, another one? Did it come around already again? <laughs> oh, well. Uh, it just, as my dad said, always used to say, as he got older, uh, when birthdays came around, he says, you might as well celebrate it. It beats the alternative. <laughs> well, today we're going to be uh, spending some time in the books of a book of Acts. Uh, in my sermon, we're going to look at Acts 9. And it talks about the time when, when the Apostle Paul uh, was converted and Jesus uh, appeared to him on the road to Damascus. But before that, in Acts 4... It tells of a time when Peter is preaching, and, and he and uh, he, he was healing through the power of Jesus. He had healed a man, and he was called in by the Jewish leaders before the Sanhedrin. It says in Acts 4, 3, they seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. If you remember on the uh, day of Pentecost when Peter stood up and preached, 3,000 believed. So another couple thousand. The church is continuing to grow as people believe. But they were asking him, how is it that this person was healed? And Jesus go, or Peter goes on to say, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. And then he says, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we may be saved. As people believed, they were saved. They received salvation in Jesus Christ, who is the way and the truth and the life. And very early on, before Christians were called Christians, they were called followers of the way, because Jesus is the way. And so it begins with belief. And I hope that your belief today is strengthened as you come to believe even more strongly that Jesus truly is the way, the truth, and the life. May he be that for you today. Fritz is going to come up and he's going to lead us in, uh, in singing. And I think he's going to begin with a special about belief. Good morning. 
I have to talk with I worked for a phone company for years, and I worked with a guy the whole time I was there. And uh, he was a great guy. That uh, He and I traveled many different roads together. And through the years, of course, first we worked together every day, all day. And then we separated, went on our own jobs and stuff, but we still worked together and had interface with each other. And one day, he, we were sitting there eating lunch or something, and uh, he says, Fritz, he says, I've known you for a long time. He says, in the last so long, whatever it was, he says, you've changed. And I said, thank you. And uh, I believed. And it was a great time when he said that to me, knowing the paths, different paths that we had taken and the same roads that we'd traveled before, but I had changed. And I think the more we believe and trust in God, in Christ, the more we change. And the more people see that in us, and it makes the words to this song mean a lot more, I believe. And listen to the lyrics and how, that's why I picked this song. It, it has so much meaning, and it brings, I think, the best out of us. And we want to share that best with others. Thank you. I believe for every drop of rain that falls, a flower grows. I believe that somewhere in the darkest night a candle glows. I believe for everyone that goes astray, someone will come to show. Someone in the grave somewhere hears every word. Every time I hear a new more baby cry or touch a leaf or see the sky. A lot of words to that song. We don't sing them, we think them. And uh, that's why I asked everybody to do think about those words. Since you don't have a pew Bible, but I do, yours is on the wall. <laughs> uh, when the roll is called up yonder. Wow. 
when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. And then when we get there and there's rolls called, that the first thing we have to have is victory in Jesus. So that's our next song, victory. <laughs> song I looked at it and I, and I said well you can't do one and three you have to do the whole song plus the refrain we got to do the whole thing folks so <clears throat> just a closer walk with the okay is my Safely o'er to thy kingdom 
Thank you for it. Um, you know, when I sing that, I always go back to the days years ago when I um, sang in a quartet and we sang that song. And so we sing it uh, in unison, but my head keeps reverting back to parts. <laughs> and I sang a tenor lead, but, but the, the best part in that, I think, was the bass part where, you know, the bass uh, would just sing, just a closer walk, just a closer walk. And it's just, you know, under, underneath it all, and we'd be moving in and out of that, and it was just, uh, that's a wonderful, wonderful old hymn. You know, it's interesting how God works. Um, on Thursday, I got together with uh, Jeff Jones, the pastor at Harmony Church, just, you know, a couple of pastors getting together. We went to Beans on Broad, we didn't know it closed at three, and, and I got there a little bit after, but they were still open. So I was able to get, you know, my, my drink. And even better yet, uh, Jeff says I'm buying. So, you know, but it closed. So we sat outside. It was a lovely day. We were sitting outside, you know, on the table right outside Beans on Broad and telling people that kept coming, sorry, it's closed, sorry, it's closed. <laughs> but after a wonderful visit for about an hour and a half, uh, he left and, and uh, I thought, hey, this is um, farmer's market day right across the street. So I'm gonna go see if Dan and Sandy McDowell are there. And they were and, and we got talking and I got some wonderful peaches. Boy, we've had some of their peaches, they're delicious. Um, but we were talking and just for quite a while, um, eventually Virginia came along and joined the conversation. But they were telling me that, um, you know, Dan's dad, Jim, wasn't doing very well. He's gone back into uh, Grove Manor, the nursing home, and he's had, off and on for years, problems with infections in his feet and toe and all that kind of thing, and the uh, medicine, not real pleasant. And Sandy said that he had decided not to aggressively pursue this and take the medicine and it was probably just you know a matter of time a and the problem is the nursing homes you can't go in and visit now but he's on the first floor and right next his bed's right next to the window and I'd visited him like that before but she said the last couple times they'd gone to visit Jim he wasn't alert and the window wasn't open and they weren't able to visit him but I said heck I'm gonna try it anyways so I went, and even before I could knock on the window, I'm walking up, you know, through the flower bed <laughs> to the window, and he was awake, and he looked at me, and I could hear, Pastor Billy, because that's what he always liked to call me, Pastor Billy, and he, and he perked up, and the aide came over and opened the window, and we, and, and we talked, and he was tired, and, you know, but as I would pray with him, and I just... It's just cool how all through this you could see God working and God does that in our lives, right? Those little blessings, those little ways that the Spirit is at work and as we are obedient to that and follow it, 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 it makes uh, for some pretty special times. And, but keep Jim and, and the family in prayer uh, during a time. And, and we know uh, without a doubt, uh, Jim you know, loves the Lord with all his heart um, I know that I would go and visit him and uh, even after, you know, he wasn't able to come because even when he could come, but he was staying home with Melva, um, he'd always be telling me about, you know, the lesson for the week because he'd take the True Blue class Bible lesson for the week and kept doing it at home, faithfully doing it at home. And 
uh, when God calls him home, we know that, uh, well, he'll be missed. It'll be a time to celebrate a saint that's gone home. Uh, but let's keep him in the family in prayer. And the other things that are on our heart, will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you now. And we are so grateful that you're with us. We can celebrate birthdays. Lord, we can pray for those who are coming to the end of life here on earth. But it's just the beginning of an incredible life with you in heaven. Help us to remember that that everlasting life has already begun for us who have believed in Jesus Christ. For we have died to sin and been raised to new life in him. Help us to live with that kind of perspective, Lord. When we're faced with challenges and struggles, big and small in life, help us to never lose that perspective, that eternal perspective. It's all going to work out. It might not be easy. It might be pretty hard and even painful at times here on earth in this broken, sinful world. But Lord, you have an amazing future planned for us. Help us to keep that in mind as we think about what's going on in the world and all the division and heartache. And as we pray for it, as we pray for the people in this world, Lord, as we pray for our, our nation, as we pray for those who don't know you, that they might come to belief. As we pray, Lord, help us Help us, Lord, to not forget the hope that is ours in Christ Jesus, who died and rose again. And because he died and rose again, we who are in Christ will live with him forever. Not only that, Lord, we can live by his power and strength here on earth. We can live a rich, full, abundant life because we know he's with us. He lives in us and it's no longer we who live, but Christ who lives in us. Some of us, Lord, uh, may be carrying a burden today. It could be a burden of grief. It could be a burden of anxiety or worry or fear. It could be a temptation we're struggling with. Or, or maybe we fall into when we feel a burden of guilt because of the sin that has gotten a hold of us. We thank you that in Christ, the power of sin is broken. That burden is lifted and that we can live free in him. So right now, Lord, right now we lay our burden down and we confess our sins knowing that you forgive our sins and wash them away by the blood of the lamb. you Lord thank you for removing our sin as far as from the east as from the west and the north as from the south thank you that we can stand clean before you Lord not because of anything we've done but because of what Christ has done and because he has given his righteousness to us and so we are made holy and righteous in his name Father, we pray for our church. Guide Center Church, Lord, during a time of transition and change. It's hard. We struggle sometimes when we have to deal with change and transition. But Lord, you don't struggle. You know our future and you have a great future planned for each of us and for our church as we follow you and trust you to guide us through it. Impart your wisdom to us so that we might make good and godly decisions that advance the kingdom and bring glory and honor to praise to you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for hearing our prayers and the prayers that have been unspoken but have been prayed in our hearts and by the Holy Spirit with words that we couldn't even say. 
thank you, Lord. We ask all this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, our high priest who continually intercedes on our behalf and who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So it's definitely summer. Uh, we've had lots of hot wet weather lately. And, uh, you know, I, I try to remind myself when it's like 90 plus degrees and really hot and humid. I try to remind myself that in January it's 20 degrees and a zero degree wind chill. So I'm not going to complain about 90. <laughs> but it's summer and it's the time we go on road trips. And fortunately, that's one of the things that we can safely do now, even in this time of uh, the coronavirus. We can go on, on road trips with our, our family or our spouse and get out a little bit. Well, there was a family that went on a road trip, was going off on a little vacation. And they were driving along, and they came to a sign that said, road closed, do not enter. And the mother said, oh, darn it. That means we have to go the long way, and that'll take a lot longer, but I guess that's what we have to do. But the father, being a guy, said, eh, maybe this isn't what it seems. And zipped around the uh, sign, and off he went down the road. And for a while, it looked like, hey, that was a good decision. Because he went several miles, and he thought, well, maybe they forgot to take the sign down. It doesn't look like there's any problem here. Maybe they fixed it. That went well until he came to the next sign that said bridge out. So he had to turn around and drive back, and, you know, it would have been better to have just you know, gone a long way from the beginning. But as they got closer to the road close sign that they saw that he went around, they noticed that there was some words on the back side of that sign. You can only see coming the direction. As he got closer to the sign, it said, Welcome back. You idiot. <laughs> well, something like that happened to the Apostle Paul here in Acts 9. Before he became the Apostle Paul, he was known as Saul. And something like that happened to him. But before we get into that, let's pray and ask that God would speak to us. Lord, We'll see today that Saul was going one direction in life. He thought he was doing what you wanted him to do. He was passionate about that, to persecute the Christians. And yet, when he encountered Jesus on that road to Damascus, he learned just how wrong he was. I was going in the opposite direction, but you changed his course. And after, Lord, he changed direction, he went out and by your power changed the world. And we're here largely because of, of what you did through, through Paul. Happens to us, Lord, sometimes we get off on the wrong path. Turn us around like you turned him around. Get us back on the right path, the straight and narrow path that leads to salvation and blessing in our lives. Speak to us the way you spoke to him in a powerful way so that, Lord, we're transformed. We're made 
new in Christ. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening in Jesus' name. Amen. And so the story begins in Acts 9-1. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. He was breathing out murderous threats against, against the disciples. And he was passionate. He felt that God wanted him to do away with this Jesus movement. That it was corrupting true Judaism that this Jesus was, was simply a false messiah, a false prophet. And he was going to Damascus with papers and orders from the high priest to do just that, to, to, to find out who these Christians were in Damascus and arrest them and bring them back to Jerusalem for trial. He was going to do away with it. He thought that was God's will for his life. He was passionate about that. But he would learn that his passion was misguided. That can happen to us, right? We can be passionate. We can believe sincerely about something and be sincerely wrong. There's a lot of people like that in the world. We see that. A lot of people who are exhibiting a lot of passion, doing some terrible things, <laughs> But they're passionate about it. But Paul came to realize how misguided he was. And later on, he described this in Philippians 3. In Philippians 3, the second half of uh, verse 4, he says, If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church. He was passionate about that. As for righteousness based on the law of faultless, faultless, he was seeking to follow every jot and tittle in the law. He was going to do exactly what it said. But then he encountered Jesus. And he realized how wrong he'd been. He goes on in verse 7, For, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage. Stinking garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, because that was elusive. He never would, could be good enough to attain that righteousness. And so it was always frustrating. He always fell short. But that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith that I received as a gift through grace. I want to know Christ just to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. He's so passionate now for Christ. He, here's the guy who hated everything about Jesus. And now he's so passionate for him, he says, I'm willing to suffer for him. In fact, if I suffer for him, it's, it's a good thing because that draws me closer to Jesus and his sufferings. I understand more of what he went through for me. And I get the privilege of participating in his sufferings. His passion completely changed. Do we have that same passion for Jesus? Is that same fire burning in us? Well, the only way that fire gets lit is when we, like Paul, or Saul at the time, have a personal encounter with Jesus Christ the risen Lord. Now, that may take place in different ways. For Paul, it was pretty spectacular. You know, we'll see the light burst and he fell to the ground as if dead. 
We might not have had that kind of experience. Maybe we have. Maybe it's been more of a gradual experience with Christ as you've grown up in a church, but along the way, you can probably look back to particular times when, you know, he came and spoke in a more profound way. Certainly, as, as we grow in Christ, we have to come to a place where we realize, even if we can't say it was this time or this time, particular moment in time, we know that we're born again. But for him, it was a spectacular experience. But however that experience happened and continues to happen because we hopefully have these experiences with Christ throughout our lives. And if he is abiding in us and we're abiding in him, that it's ongoing. But the truth is, we tend to you know, come in and out a little bit because we're weak and, and sinful creatures. So let's look at, at verses 3 to 7 of Acts 9 as we continue uh, the story. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. He didn't even know. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you, are, you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. So his traveling companions heard a sound, but they didn't really understand what was going on. This message was for Paul, or for Saul. This was for him. He was speaking personally to him. Now, I'm sure they probably asked him about it later, and we don't know, but hopefully they came to faith because they're like, whoa, what happened there? Even if they didn't understand it, Paul later, I would guess he would have explained things to them. I don't know. It doesn't say what, what happened to them or whether they believed or not. A personal encounter with Jesus is powerful. It's life-changing. And there are certain characteristics of a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. Things that we, we see here. The first one is, a personal encounter with Jesus will not be what you expected. It will not be what you expected. Paul thought he would be marching into Jerusalem, or into Damascus, I'm sorry, into Damascus on fire looking for the Christians. Instead, he was led blinded by hand. You know, by hand. He had no expectation, I'm sure, that as he was heading to Damascus, he was going to hear a voice from heaven that threw him to the ground. He had no idea that that voice was going to be the voice of Jesus. He thought Jesus was a false messiah. A lot of unexpected things happen. That's what Jesus tends to do, right? Right? If you read uh, the Gospels, time and time again, he flips things upside down. The things that you expect, he does the opposite. Something very unexpected. So when you have an encounter with Jesus, be looking for that. Expect the unexpected. A personal encounter with Jesus will address questions you didn't know needed answers. There are going to be questions that are asked that you didn't even know needed to be asked. Saul, Saul, Jesus said, why do you persecute me? Heck, he didn't even know he was persecuting Jesus. Well, I guess he did know he was persecuting Jesus, but he didn't know that Jesus was truly the Son of God and the true Messiah until that moment. And he asked a question, and that's okay. We can ask questions to God, whatever questions are on our heart. Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Whoa. God has a way of doing that, right? Asking questions. Some questions we may not want to have to deal with. Because <laughs> they 
may result in some real change in our life, change how we think, change how we behave. A personal encounter with Jesus will reveal things about Jesus and also some things about you. Who are you? I'm Jesus. Wow, I didn't know that. Good place to start. <laughs> But, you know, we have this personal encounter with Jesus, and we meet with Jesus. Hopefully we're learning more about him and who he truly is as, as he reveals himself to us. I mean, that's who Jesus is, right? He is God's revelation. We can't see God, but Jesus came in human flesh. People say, well, how do I know what God's like? Look at Jesus. That's God. That's who he is. And you're going to, it's going to reveal some things about yourself when you really get to see Jesus for who he is. You know, this, I don't know, a few days ago, there was uh, one of the guys on CNN, Don Lemon or Don Lemon, I don't know how you say his last name. He talked about, he, 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 meant, he said something to the extent that Jesus wasn't perfect. And a lot of blowback on that. People saying, wait a minute. We're not perfect. But he's the only one who was. That's at the core of the gospel, right? The core of what scripture says. You need to understand some things about Jesus, right? But in light of Jesus' perfection, his holiness, his sinlessness, we realize just how sinful we are and how much we need him. Because we aren't what he is and we want to be that, but he provides a way. By dying on the cross, our sins are forgiven. By the blood of the lamb, they're washed away. We're made pure and holy in God's sight. He imputes his righteousness to us. We can stand before God clean and holy before him. So we learn a lot about ourselves, but we have to be honest with ourselves, right? We can't hide anything from God anyways. You know, I've always marveled at the fact that David, who was a murderer and adulterer and did all kinds of terrible things, is also called a man after God's own heart. How is that even possible? Well, maybe... Because when he does these terrible things, he comes clean. He, he confesses his sin to the Lord, knows that he desperately needs God's, God's mercy and love in his life. And, and so when we meet Jesus personally, we learn about Jesus and we learn about ourselves and it will drive us deeper into our faith. If you go on to verses eight and nine, Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Pretty clear, Jesus was saying, you have been blind. You have been spiritually blind. You thought you knew exactly what God wanted you to do, and you were completely blind. Sometimes that happens to us, right? We're blinded. We may be missing something. And so it's important as we go deeper to think about that. I mean, I know... You know, when you really spend time in the Word or prayer, just listening to God, there's always something that I learn. There's all these aha moments. Wow. I've read that scripture hundreds of times and never saw that before. <laughs> right? That's, that's what God does. But we need to keep going deeper. It's easy in life. Uh, we get busy and, and, you know, we just kind of keep doing the same thing. But that keeps us at the same level. We should, you know, if you, if you spent, let's say you said, I'm going to spend one minute a week, um, or one minute a day. How about this? Let's, one minute a day more. 
Think how much more time you'd be spending with Jesus over the course of the year, right? Even one minute a week, that's a, a good bit more. Constantly challenge yourself. Are you going deeper? Are you, maybe I'm going to read a book that's going to challenge me a little bit. Get me to think a little deeper, think theologically. I, I'm going to do this, this one thing. I'm going to go and, and serve God in, in this new way. Always pushing ourselves, going deeper, but taking time to think, to meditate. Three days didn't eat or drink. Uh, some of us, that may be kind of hard to do, but I, that's about the longest I've ever gone for a fast. I didn't do without drinking, though, but I did not eat for three days. And it's interesting. It, you really get to think about what it does to your physical body as you're praying. and it, 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 Interesting, the dynamic, how that works uh, in a spiritual retreat. Fasting is powerful. Even if it's fasting one meal or turning off the TV and fasting for TV for an evening or something, anything that allows you to go deeper. And then a personal encounter with Jesus will send you in a new direction with a new purpose in life. That's exactly what it did for Saul. Now later on, you know, God spoke to this man Ananias who was to go to Paul. In verses 15 and 16, though, God shares with Ananias what this purpose, this new purpose would be for Paul. Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. He's going to take the gospel out to the world, especially to the Gentiles. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Not going to be easy. It's going to be hard. Maybe that was the thing that tipped Ananias to make him go was, oh, he's going to suffer. <laughs> He was their enemy. Oh, okay, I'll do it if he's going to suffer, you know. I don't really think that's exactly what Ananias was thinking because we'll see later on he calls him brother, brother Paul. But at this point in time, Saul is being transformed. And he would eventually become Paul, the apostle. Uh, Max Lucado in the Life Lesson Study Bible describes this whole event, what took place on the road to Damascus. And I just want you to listen to this. I think he does this in a, in a very interesting way. Before he encountered Christ, Paul had been somewhat of a hero among the Pharisees. Blue-eyed and blue-blooded and wild-eyed, this young zealot was hell-bent on keeping the kingdom pure. And that meant keeping the Christians out. He marched through the countryside like a general demanding that backslidden Jews salute the flag of the motherland or kiss their family in hopes goodbye. All this came to a halt, however, on the shoulder of a highway. That's when someone slammed on the stadium lights and he heard the voice. When he found out whose voice it was, his jaw hit the ground and his body followed. He braced himself for the worst. He knew it was all over. He prayed that death would be quick and painless. But all he got was silence and the first of a lifetime of surprises. He ended up bewildered and befuddled in a borrowed bedroom. God left him there a few days with scales on his eyes so thick that the only direction he could look was inside himself, and he didn't like what he saw. He saw himself for what he really was, to use his own words, the worst of sinners. Alone in the room with his sins on his conscience and blood on his hands, remember, he was there overseeing the death of Stephen, the first Christian martyr. He literally had blood on his hands. He asked to be cleansed. The legalist Saul was buried, and the liberator Paul was born. He was never the same afterwards, and neither was the world. Everything changed. Everything changed in that personal encounter. Max Lucado also said, God used Paul to touch the world, but he first used Ananias to touch Paul. God used Paul to touch the world, but first he had to use Ananias to touch Paul. And that's the other part of the story. 
that we need to look at it. It's verses 10 to 19. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias! Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord said to him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. Don't ever say God doesn't have a sense of humor or a bit of irony. Saul thought he was doing what God wanted. And where did he send him? Where did he stay? Straight Street. <laughs> I'm going to put you on a straight and narrow. It's not going to be where you think, but I'm going to put you there. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Interesting, isn't it? So as God was speaking to Saul in this vision, he's speaking to Ananias in a vision. That's what God does. Sometimes we wonder, God, how come this has taken so long for things to work out? Well, maybe he's speaking to you, but he's speaking to somebody else or some other people and then has to pull this all together, right? And it may take a little time. At any rate, he's speaking to both of them. And then Ananias says, Lord, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. Why are you asking me to go to this guy? This is the worst enemy of your people, of, of, of the believers. Why in the world do you want me to go to him of all people? Smite him down, you know? It's probably what he's thinking. Thinking some of the Psalms that talk about smiting your enemies. That wouldn't have been easy. It wouldn't have been easy for him to go to what was his worst enemy. Somebody who wanted nothing but ill and had a record of doing very bad things to people. And yet, Jesus said in Matthew 5, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. That's what he's done. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We were enemies of God and he loved us. And if we're going to be like Jesus, if we're going to be like God, we need to do the same thing, even though it's hard. He causes his sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Yes, Jesus sets the bar high for his followers to love your enemies. But he wants us to be different than others in the world. We should look and act differently. And part of that is something very hard. It's loving your enemies or going and reaching out and caring about people who don't care about you. But Ananias did that. God said in, in uh, verse 15, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul. He'd been so changed. Paul wasn't the only heart that was being transformed. Ananias had to have his heart transformed to where he could go to his enemy and call him a brother. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may uh, uh, see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. Physical representation of his blindness, of the sin and, uh, that needed to to fall away, that was being cleansed by Jesus. What scales are blinding us that may be preventing us from seeing things the way God sees it, by seeing the world the way he sees it through his eyes of love and mercy and grace. He got up and was baptized. Baptism, we die to sin and rise to new life and we're forgiven. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. 
The world was changed because Ananias was in the end faithful and went. Think about it. Paul went on, Paul went on to take the gospel to the Gentiles in the Bible to really lay the foundation for our Christian theology and belief and to change the world forever. But look at the part Ananias had in that. Who is God calling you and me to touch with his love and saving grace? You know, like Ananias, probably not going to be easy because we'll have to overcome doubts and fears, maybe even some prejudices we have against our enemy or somebody who we don't really agree with. But Jesus still says go. So who will you and I go to for Jesus? To whom will we be their Ananias? Right now, I want you to think about that for a moment. I want you to, we're just going to have a moment of quiet prayer. And I want you to pray and ask God to reveal to you one person, one person that he wants you to go to and to be their Ananias, to, to touch with the love and grace of Jesus Christ. Let's quietly pray. Lord, sometimes you ask us to do hard things, things that we may resist and not want to do, especially when it's reaching out to people that have hurt us or we may disagree with. But Lord, that's what you've done with us. You've loved us when we weren't, love on, when we weren't very lovable. And help us to do the same. Lord, what a difference that'll make in this world. Because that's not how the world treats one another. People don't love their enemies. Right now they cancel them, they shout them down, and express so much hatred towards people who disagree with them. What a light we can be in this world, in this nation, just by reaching out to people we disagree with, by loving our enemies. Yeah, it's real hard, but by your spirit, we can do what we can't do on our own. Help us to see the world the way you see it through your eyes of love. Help us, Lord, to have the compassion in our hearts and empathy for those who are hurting and lost. Who knows, we might be the Ananias that touches them and helps bring them into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Give us the courage to reach out in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, um, that's one of the ways that we go into the world. We do it one person at a time. But we also need to remember that we go into the world through the things we do together, our shared ministries, which we support through our tithes and offerings here at Center Church. We really appreciate your faithfulness and uh, we have the opportunity each week to do that. I think it's good because it reminds us it's an ongoing thing. So if you haven't done it yet, don't forget to drop your offering in the uh, box out in the narthex as we support the work of the Lord through Center Church. Lord bless the work of this church, not to bring us glory, but that you might be glorified through us. Bless 
these offerings, the, the gift of our hands and hearts, and use it to touch lives so that one life at a time people might see their lives turned around by Jesus Christ. Help the gospel to go forth through this church in all its power. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Uh, so I guess we have our closing uh, song. So let's stand for our close. Verse of how great thou art. Next week, um, Damon Covert will be here to lead music, so I'm sure that'll be, be, be great as we um, uh, gather here to worship again. Invite a friend and uh, tell them about it. And ready yet? Bring them with you. Uh, also, there are a couple of announcements in the back of your little bulletin you can take with you and check those out. Um, as we uh, go. Before we go, one of the things we started last week was a time of prayer. Um, and so we want, during this time of, of transition in our church and with all that's going on in our nation, the only way we can get through this is through prayer. And, and we can never pray too much. And so um, different people will be praying um, each week. Um, we're bound, bond, you know, I would have you um, get together in a circle, except that with the tape and all this kind of stuff, it's kind of hard to move. <laughs> but imagine that we're all gathered in a circle. <laughs> and if it were not uh, the time of coronavirus, we'd be holding hands because we're one, one in Christ, part of his body. Let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we pray your blessing upon this time. We pray, Lord, that you would guide and direct, direct Center Church, direct us, Lord, during a time of uncertainty. There's so much uncertainty in our world. We don't know what's coming next every time we think that we're making progress in the COVID crisis, Lord. More people come down with it and more restrictions. It's hard. All the stops and starts, we just don't know. But you know, Lord. You hold us in the palm of your hand. You know what's going to happen in our nation and world. You know what's going to happen for this church. And you love your church. You have the best in mind for it. Lord, we thank you that you guide and direct us, that we don't take this path alone, but that you're with us and if we look to you, you'll guide us forward. Be with our session as they meet and prepare uh, to, Lord, hire a transitional pastor. And I pray you would be with me as you would reveal to me the next step in my life. And help us all to remember that we're all part of the body of Christ. And we are part of a larger body that encompasses this whole world and people who have died and gone on to be with you and are part of 
of the body of Christ on earth and in heaven. And one day we'll be together forever. May what happens now, Lord, prepare us for that and take us down the path that leads to that and helps center church, Lord, to make and mature disciples and to reach out to the lost and hurting people in our community and bring more people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Lord, send us out into the world to be your Ananiasis, to go and touch, touch people with the love and grace of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Brian. We needed a few of a quick escape route. I don't know, is that on or not? Hello? Okay. So, uh, wanted to put this out there. Uh, the last couple of weeks, uh, I've been messaging back and forth with Mary Jo Summers of the Alpha and Omega Center. Uh, their Newcastle location has a hodgepodge list of some tasks that they would like to get done in the next couple of weeks. Uh, originally, she had reached out to me about just having our youth do it, and then it quickly became, uh, we could actually use some adults too. So um, the tasks include everything from some painting in a couple rooms to folding uh, and stuffing envelopes, some yard work, a bunch of stuff. Um, they'd like to get it done in the next couple weeks. So uh, if you're interested, if it's something, uh, you know, you think you could give a couple hours on a Saturday uh, or on an evening during the week, even they said they're really flexible about when we could do it. Uh, please see me. Uh, I'd love to coordinate that. You know, we we support them through our benevolences. Sarah comes and speaks here, uh, and this is just a really great opportunity for us to uh, to do some work to to get our hands directly involved in supporting their their ministry. So please see me uh, after the service if you're interested.